Greetings everyone. This is going to be a brief non-technological talk about yarn spinning and the problems we are encountering in, in the industry. I'm not go, going to go into the details, just some problems we were encountering and maybe the basic of the production of yarn spinning. Here is some bio background. I'm a mechanical engineer. I don't work in the IT. I'm not a programmer. However, nowadays everything is reliant on the computers. The better, the better we are, you are at the computers, the better you are doing your job. Also, I like hedgehogs. Are there any surfers here? Great. Or cyclists or scuba divers. Excellent. Have you ever wondered how your wetsuit is made, your cycling dress or scuba gear? Now you will know. In the textile industry, we have two types of fibers, natural fibers and man-made fibers, synthetics. Natural fibers are wool, silk, and cotton. They are as is. You cannot change them. You can change the DNA of the plant or the sh or ship, but that's it. Regarding the man-made synthetic fibers, you can do exact fibers you want. Uh, tenacity, strength, thickness, color, you name it, you can do exactly what you want. And there's, a, there's also a major advantage to the man-made fibers. You can recycle them. One, up to 100% of synthetic fibers you can recycle. You cannot recycle cotton, wool, or silk. Up to limited degrees, yes, but after that, you will only get a low quality yarn. Synthetic fibers are up to 100% recyclable. So synthetic fibers, everything that starts with poly, it's synthetic. Polyester, polypropylene, polyamide, you name it. This is, these are artificial fibers. There are also commercial names. Lycra, nylon, nylostan, econil, and, um, and uh, elastan. So, how it is made? In the past, it was usually made from crude oil. There is no question about it. That's why all the industry was in India, Bangladesh, and China. Nowadays, we are using the recycled energy all the waste material is brought back to the plant and recycled. So next time when you're wearing your fancy new wetsuit, think of it, 90% is made from 50 years old garbage. True story. So nowadays we recycle everything, so the whole process is much more cleaner. But basically, in any case, we, we either get the, the caprolactam, which is the main ingredient, the derivate from the oil, or we recycle it. Then we process, it in, we process it in the yarn spinning plant, and we get these little colorful bobbins. 99.9% .9 of our products is this. Then this is used for the actual textile industry, also for airbags, seat belts, and carpets. Just to read the background, I work in Aquafil Slovenia. It's part of the bigger group Aquafil International. Uh, there are many companies all around the globe, but the biggest concentration is in Europe, and actually our company is one of the biggest in whole Europe. To get a quick picture, yearly we do 70,000 70, metric tons of products each year. That's 10 trucks of material into the factory and 10, 10 trucks of materials out of the country, out of the, the factory each day. We have 800 employees here in Ljubljana, and we are the second biggest consumer of electricity in Slovenia. Even for Slovenian standard, that's huge. So, in the past, all the waste energy was dumped into the sea, into the water, into the air. Now we want to recycle any, everything. To get a picture of how much energy we produce, if anyone who has been to Atlantis Water City, with saunas, pools, hot water, spas. 100% of the hot water used in Atlantis 
is transferred from aquafil plant, which is across the street, to the Atlantis. 100%. We could easily open another Atlantis and still have some waste energy to spare. So we can accommodate into our production. But we try to regenerate, recuperate everything. Traditionally, yarn was made on spinning wheels. It was Indo-European thing. Uh, but on these lands in Slovenia, we used a specially augmented spinning wheel. We call it kolorat, which was ordinary spinning wheel with some modification. It was better than everyone else's, so we have it in our blood. Regardless of this, the final, probus, the final products are these bobbins, bobbins of yarn which are used for textile industry mostly. It takes 10 hours to create one of these bob bobbins. It weights 15 kilograms. There's a banana for scale. Would anyone like to take a guess what is the length of the yarn if we unwind it? Just take a guess. 15 kilograms of yarn. 10 kilometers. 10, 10, 10 kilometers. Close, 10,000 kilometers. Bilbo Baggins could go from Shire to Mordor three times with one, with one yarn and still come back safely in one piece. So how we do it? When we get our raw material, the caprolactam, we store it in the siloses, then we melt it with about 300 degrees, then transfer it to the extruder, uh, extruder has a giant screw in it. It will make a spaghetti of yarn. And this yarn is then delivered to the chuck of the spinning wheel. And this is then transferred to the, to the paper bobbins we see here. So, to create one of these bobbins, you need about 150 different parameters. Some of them are static, you just input them. Some of them are dynamic. You have to monitor them, measure them, like pressure, temperature, speed, revolutions. But you have to measure everything. Each machine has about 150 sensors inside. Controllers, PLC that you have to monitor. On one production line, we have up to 100 machines to monitor. So 150 parameters for one machine, up to 100 machines to monitor. Then for the ISO standard, you have to store all the information, all the variables, all the results for month, on, month of history for each variable. That's a lot of data. A lot of data to process, a lot of data to store, to manage, and to analyze. Would anyone like to take a guess what kind of computational power do you need for this? What would be a computer that can manage such a plant? <laughs> what? 486. Four, you cheat. 486. <laughs> computer is enough for this. We still have some of this in the company. <laughs> and they're using Windows 95. <laughs> so you're probably asking the same thing as I did when I came to the company. Silly guys, why don't you upgrade? That's stupid. Why don't you bring a Arduino or Raspberry Pi? It's faster than 486. Well, there are technical problems why we can't do and why we don't want to. First thing, we don't want to. When you buy such a machines, you want it to run indefinitely. The, the normal lifespan of the machines are 20 years, give or take a decade. So naturally, like a nuclear plant, which runs 11 months of the year, and for the last month, it shuts down refuels for regular maintenance. It's same here in the company. You want your machines to be running indefinitely and only stop for regular maintenance. So we have some more machines that will have been running for 20 years with combined stop of one month. Other, otherwise, they were running for 20 years nonstop. We are producing about 50 tons of material each day on each production line. So every day when we, we, we are stopped, we are not generating money. And 
when you buy such a machine, that's expensive. We're talking about ten, tens of millions of dollars. Also, the maintenance costs are extreme. You need heat, you need workers, you need electricity, you need gas, you need nitrogen to maintain such a line at operational temperatures. So we don't want to stop our production line. Sometimes it's cheaper to just buy a new line than, than to be stopped for six or seven months to upgrade it. For instance, we could buy a new production line now, but we, which is available on the market, but it will be about five years old. The technology will be five years old. It takes at least one month to assemble it here on the plant. Then you need at least six months to build it. Then you need another six months to start it, to, to connect everything, to test it. Then you need at least six months to optimize all the settings. So you need about three years from now until you start producing the articles that you want. If you want to start from scratch, that's at least five years from now. So in any case, the technology you get will be deprecated, at least regarding the computers. The second part is we can't. We have hardware problems, we have software problems. In the past, it was hard to obtain a machinery, but easy to create software for it. In those era, you could have one computer and uh, create a software for it, and it would work. NASA went to space with these 486s on their uh, space shuttles. If they can do it, so can we. So how magic happens? We have process management on the PC. Here you have the temperatures, the extruder, you set everything, you create set points, which are then transferred to the controller locker. Here, the most of black magic happens. There you have switches, PLCs, and controllers. They will actually engage the valves, the gouges, initiate the current for the machinery. This data will get translated and sent to the PLCs, which are actually inside the, the, the spinning machines. The spinning machines, extruders, and all the stuff are autonomous. They can run indefinitely, even if you unplug the computer from it. So if there is a breakages, they will continue to run. However, you, you won't be able to monitor or, and, and you won't be able to, to change the settings. So when you create a line, the biggest problem are these controller lockers. It takes, for us, it took about three months just to establish the connections for these lockers. This is where the magic happens. So problems we encounter, some, only some of the problems we encounter. This is a bit out of my league, but I'm going to try to explain it. We used to have a Pentium era processor, a computer with this processor, with a COM port. Standard COM port, there's nothing unusual about it. One day, motherboard died. No problem, we will be replacing it with a new, faster computer. We turn on the computer, it did not recognize the COM, com port. What was the problem? It's only a comport. Then we found another computer which was older, if it was old. Plug it in, it recognized. Then we try a new computer again, a different one. It did not, it did not find, find the comport. What was the problem? From the tele telemetry we analyzed, there used to be some obscure standard for comport. Our manufacturer created it and was only used for a brief moment of time. The older motherboards have hardware support for these COM ports. The new ones don't have it. So we actually can't use any new motherboards for this. So as I said before, sometimes it's cheaper to buy old computers from eBay than do the upgrade. Here's also an example of proprietary hardware. Up there on the left, this is a standard gouge for the pressure. 
on your right is the same gouge that our manufacturer sent us with the nozzle in it. There's a, there's a small nozzle in it. Without it, the pressure gouge won't work. You can't find it anywhere on the market. You have to buy it manufacturer or manufacture it yourself. In any case, costs are increasing. The second, the second picture is a manifold. This is actually Bolton polymer inside. And this is actually solid, but in normal operation, it, it would be liquid. And these are two parts of the manifold. Between those two manifolds, there's a ceiling. And with this ceiling, when, when it comes in contact with both parts of the manifold, it deforms. Once you do, want to do the maintenance or change anything, you cannot reuse the ceiling. It is damaged. So we have to buy a new one from the manufacturer or produce it yourself. In any case, you have problem. However, nowadays, we have more software problems than hardware problems. We just created our new line in January. It took us six months to establish, and that's super fast. But the software in this, it uses virtualized image container, which is based on Windows 6P. Our backend is considered bleeding edge. We just upgraded to Windows 7 and Linux. That's considered bleeding edge in the industry. However, the actual software which you virtualize is on Windows XP. It is digitally designed, single use license, and you cannot copy it on other machine. If your machine breaks, you will have to buy a new one. Exactly the same one as producer meant. Either you buy it from a manufacturer, or you try to find the exactly same specification. Good luck 10 years from now. And it's also Windows only. You can't virtualize it anywhere. So the final thoughts. Programmers, when you're, when you're creating your code, please, please think of the guys that will be using your code 20, 30 years from now. Please think of them. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. Do you, uh, do you see a point in the future where you will have no choice but to upgrade, and if no, why do you think you'll be able to run indefinitely on this setup? Basically, do you think that you'll be able to run forever on this setup? No, not at all. So at, at which point no. do you think you will have no choice but to upgrade? The, mo the, mo the modern machines that are made, they're actually made to run for a maximum of 20 years. And the software is also tailored for specific hardware. Once these machines run out, you can only find it on eBay. You cannot put those virtualized machines into the new computers, like 20 years from now. You won't be able to, unless there will be some major technology breakthrough for this. So what will we do? New lines or? Um, for this line, for, I mean, in 20 years from now, you, won't, you probably won't be able to buy a new hardware for it. Yes, usually the procedure is that when, when, when you can upgrade, you will upgrade. But when it's not feasible, it's easier to buy all the new machines, all the new computers, and all the new wiring. It's not feasible just to upgrade something. This, this is proprietary hardware, proprietary wires, connectors. It takes time, it takes manpower. Sometimes it's easier just to replace everything. Yes, Ivan. <laughs> what is the right time to upgrade or to change the line when it breaks? <laughs> but then you lose money. Yes. <laughs> That's the way it is. No, for those manifolds, for the PLCs, you try to have the spare parts. For the winding machines, for all the machinery, you don't have it. You, because this costs money. If you can receive like aftermarket stuff, used, used uh, extruders, go ahead. But those big machines you, you don't have in stock. If you should buy machines that are available on the market today, no. No. It's late. No, they need it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will be needing them in the future. Yeah, right. When you're going to buy
buy new machines, they're going to run for 20 years. But what the guarantee that the software and the hardware of is going to be that, better than now? That's a good question. In 20 years from now, a machine will be running. We don't know about the software. So you're not solving the problem. <laughs> the software is a black box. We don't know what is going on. Uh, we had a problem with the company that uh, once delivered us some machines and it went bankrupt. What to do now? So we had to, we had to replace everything. Or create a new software. It's cheaper to, to buy new machines. <laughs> you know that. Uh, working with all of these problems, is it, is it mostly frustrating all the time for you? Or is it or do you feel challenged and feel like a MacGyver? <laughs> <laughs> if it's challenging to work with this problem, um, most of the time, I'm not the guy solving this problem. I'm encountering them. I'm mostly reporting them, them to the guys that are doing the maintenance. Um, for the most of the time, we don't know what's going on. When someone figure, figure it out, the solution is usually very, very simple. Otherwise, we change everything. Yes, Idar. Uh, everyone knows that basically computers, uh, the old computers were way more reliable than the new ones. I mean, 486 to still be running is not unheard of. I mean, if anyone has one of those at home, they probably still work. New computers, however, break all the time. Your, now, your computers. <laughs> my, mine especially, <laughs> but, but the new ones don't last as long. And there's, there's technical reasons for that as well, in the soldering and stuff like that. But how do you, uh, I mean, if it's so hard to replace a computer, uh, in the old days, they were really, really uh, rigid, I mean, and reliable. Now that they're not, how, how do you plan for this? So the question was, the old computers was more reliable than nowadays. This is true. It's the same with the hardware. The old extruders, the old machinery was great. It was running, it was over-designed, over it was very rigid. The, the new machines are very thin, very, very fine. They will break all the time. It's the same with the computers. Um, so regarding this, I don't know what to say. I mean, if, if, if your computer breaks in five years and you can't put it, and you can't put the software on a new one. In the past, it was easy to create a software. Because all the things were hardware manipulated. You had manifolds, you had gouges, all the old stuff. Nowadays, everything is computer guided. You only have the small valve that is opening. And everything is computer guided. So the problem from now is you can't just plug the, the new window into the computer. It will not, will not recognize it. There's no software for it. There's no driver for it. You have some proprietary connections. You don't know what they do. Um, so in the future, we don't know. So again, these machines are usually made for 20 years, give or take a decade, and then they are probably just replaced. You can't reuse them anywhere. They, they're custom-made, custom-designed, and usually it's better just to replace them.